Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the Foreign Policy Research Institute, it was founded in 1955 on the premise that a nation should think before it acts. That was good advice then. It remains good advice today. Uh, our method is to illuminate contemporary international affairs through the lens of history, geography, and culture. On this basis, we educate the public and we offer ideas that help shape the policies that advance American national interests. We have a series of programs uh, in Philadelphia, in uh, Princeton, New York City, the Main Line, and Washington, D.C. The uh, purpose of these salons is to introduce people who may not have had an opportunity to participate in FPRI otherwise. We hope you enjoy tonight's program. We hope you'll consider becoming a member of FPRI and participating in our many programs uh, throughout the year. End of commercial. Now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague uh, Jeremy Black, who is a professor of history at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Uh, we bring him over here uh, once a year for uh, uh, programs like this, or more precisely, being that we're nonprofit, we find someone else to bring him over and we piggyback <laughs> on, on that opportunity. He's also a senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, he is the author of over a hundred books, which I think makes him the most prolific historian probably in the history of the world. <laughs> so we have a historic figure with us. He's written on large topics like the history of war, the history of diplomacy, the history of maps, the history of slavery, and on more specific topics, the specific wars like the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and more specifically on on specific battles. The Battle of Waterloo is one of his books. Uh, we've asked him today, tonight, to speak on his latest book from Oxford University Press, A Century of Conflict, War, 1914 to 2014. We've asked him to address 100 years in the next 30 minutes, but we've also asked him to go a little bit beyond so that we bring him to 2015 and beyond. So please welcome Jeremy Black. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming and listening. I've always enjoyed coming to Philadelphia. I was working out this is my 18th time uh, visiting here. So the only other place I've been to the same amount of time is another favourite city of mine, which is Newport, Rhode Island. And one of the reasons I like coming here is not only that this is a beautiful city, but it also, and a human-sized city, you can walk around it. Now, how many cities in America can you say that of? But it is also a city where I have good friends, and I've always been delighted to be linked to the FPRI. War. Now, war is like any other branch of history. It's both what happens in the past and it's how we provide accounts in the present of what happens in the past. And in essence, if you're looking at the military history of the last century, at where we are today, and I would like to suggest as to where we're rolling forward into the future, there are two fundamental narratives, each relating to very different understandings of war. And one of the uh, characteristics of military history at the present moment is both of these narratives are frequently and repeatedly coming into collision. So let's start with our master narrative. Our master narrative understood as that of the West, understood as that of advanced military powers, of which the quintessential one is the United States, but the British have tried, you know, in their own way to be part of the, the game as well. And our narrative is one of military professionalism, it's one of the military in, uh, in, as a trained and specific body bound by rules and governed by hierarchies and following set tasks. It's one in which we put a lot of emphasis on the development of military technology. And it's one in which the military of that type has engaged in a number of very major wars which have meant that the last century has been defined either in terms of total war or industrial war or any other words of those types but suggesting a kind of scale and intensity of engagement in which the capacity to produce resources is absolutely crucial. So our narrative of war focuses essentially on World War I, the run-up to World War II, the Cold War, and then after that, the key theme in the 1990s and early 2000s was the revolution in military affairs, the idea that with modern technology there had been a paradigm shift towards 
a new state of war, which we were particularly good at, and then we start to come into a slightly different world, which is going to be the subject of much of what I'm talking about. Other basic narrative of war. Well, the other basic narrative of war is less focused on a single society, but it essentially is the idea of conflict as being one which is much more systemic to society as a whole, in which there is less of an emphasis on those people who are formerly soldiers, and in some of these societies there is the assumption that pretty well every adult male is cap capable of acting, should indeed be willing to act as a warrior, there are, these are societies in which much of the animosity, much of the animus, much of the conflict is directed against those that live nearby, where the political parameters are often uh, focused on issues of ethnicity, of race, of uh, religion, and where the general assumption has not been that uh, military technology and the developments and the proficiency of military technology is the measure of capability and ensures a net outcome. And that's the other narrative of uh, military history, the other one which is not particularly pronounced in our culture, not particularly pronounced at all, because in most West... Sorry, is this sound system... What's it going? Can you... Does it sound okay to you? Or can, no. Sounds okay, okay, fine. Sounds a bit odd to me, but that doesn't matter. I'm used to my voice sounding odd. Um, uh, if it gets bad, shout at me or throw something at me and I'll try and change it. Um, and the other narrative, as I've said, is one which is much more one of division within society, divisions between societies, but not focused on technology. And that... Uh, I think one can fairly say that tradition of war, those assumptions about war, equally have been powerful and potent over the last century. They've often focused on tensions between communities that were neighbouring, but they also, um, in the 19, late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, many of these ideas were mobilised in opposition to Western colonial and imperial powers, and eventually, indeed, in the case of Afghanistan, for example, between 1979 and 1988, against Soviet imperialism. And the assumptions in each case was that in some way the popular will, uh, the, as it were, a cultural vitalism, uh, was going to defeat the big battalions, was going to defeat the kind of technological supremism. So that was a different narrative. And each narrative during the 20th century was able to convince itself that it was successful, that it had the answer. So, for, ex for instance, if you'd gone to, let's say, Tanzania or Madagascar or a country like that, and bear in mind, if you're writing the military history of the world, the classic way to get it wrong is to assume that the military history of the world is defined by the lead power in the system you know, which is obviously the United States today, let's say in the 1920s, um, naval terms, it was almost certainly Britain. You know, the lead power in the system does not define what happens militarily because it doesn't actually condition the experience of how war is understood in societies further down. So you really want to understand military history. You have to work out what it means to somebody in Tanzania or Madagascar or Paraguay and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at most of those societies, Societies, their conviction was, on the whole, that military history um, similarly demonstrated that their model worked. And, of course, the ultimate example of that is, if you want a modern instance, is the way in which um, bin Laden and his crew convinced themselves that having beaten the Soviets in Afghanistan in the 1980s, they were bound to prevail, Taliban were bound to prevail, Al-Qaeda Qaeda were bound to prevail in similar struggle as they saw it, in fact it was a very different context, in the early 20th, uh, 21st century. Now, what, in essence, has happened in the 2000s and the two teens is, first, the bringing into rude collision of two very different, these two very different narratives of military history. Prior to 1990, there were, of course, collisions. There were, of course, military examples of societies very differently configured uh, confronting each other. But the actual military thought of the West throughout that period focused primarily on the possibility of conventional symmetrical warfare against other industrial advanced societies. So if you take the Cold War period, 
because you're likely to think of the Cold War period in terms of the Vietnam War. <laughs> the Vietnam War was obviously important, but American strategy in the 1960s was not dominated by Vietnam. American strategy in the 1960s was dominated, as it had been in the 1950s, by the possibility of nuclear and sub-nuclear confrontation with the Soviet Union. Vietnam, and that's, of course, helped to dictate the strategy in the Vietnam War, because Johnson, the last thing he wanted was to actually lead to the Vietnam War becoming more serious because he didn't want to actually lead to full-scale struggle against a leading communist state as had happened in the Korean War. Now, um, during this Cold War period, the major Western powers engaged in counterinsurgency struggles, but they were not foremost in their mind. That ceased and changed, obviously, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and linked to that the extent to which in the 1980s and 1990s there was a relatively close strategic partnership between the United States and China. Not as close as a formal uh, you know, alliance of the type that, let us say, the United States and Japan, but nevertheless a relatively close strategic alliance. And for those of you who are interested in strategy, it was the ability of the Nixon-Kissinger team to exploit and be exploited by, that latter narrative is one Mr Kissinger doesn't like to talk about so much, but to exploit and be exploited by the Sino-Soviet uh, rift, which helped to ensure that the United States did so well in the Cold War, helps to ensure that the Vietnam War actually ends with a strategic victory for the United States, and it helps to ensure that the last stages of the Cold War were handled much more cheaply and much less dangerously than the early stages. And if you follow through from that, you will be aware that the most significant strategic problem facing the United States and the West as a whole in the last 15 years is not various dangerous movements in um, the Middle East. It is, in fact, the re-knitting of the strategic partnership and relationship between Russia and China. That is far more serious, and that, in fact, is the basics of a very different world order, and it's the sort of one we need to think about, and you need bodies like the FPRI to think about. But going back, once the Cold War ends, you get much more power projection by the West, primarily the United States, but not just the United States. Um, into areas such as the former Yugoslavia, into the Middle East, into parts of Africa, which are intended to, as it were, fulfil the observance of a kind of benign humanitarian world order, but which end up with increasing difficulty at producing an outcome that matches the output that what the West ex expects. Let me just explain that. Military output is what most people think about when they're thinking of military affairs. Armies operate, navies move, you capture territory, you engage in battle, you kill people, you achieve um, a military output, out, output. Actually, what you want is not that. I mean, it helps, but what you want is outcome. What you need to do is to persuade the other side to observe your will. That is what you want out of will, out of war. You want to force them to observe your will. And that's actually a very different situation to, um, to the standard operational history which you look at when you look at war. So in the 1990s and 2000s, you have a, uh, a context within which at a technological optimum for that stage in global <coughs> military history, nothing like the capacity shown by the advanced military powers, prim principally the United States, but to a certain extent its allies, nothing like it had ever been seen before. You know, people were getting into planes in North Carolina and uh, were, you know, parachuting into Central Asia after aerial refuelling. People were flying out of helicopters in the Arabian <coughs> Sea, flying 450 miles and landing near Kandahar. This, these were quite remarkable in terms of force projection, in terms of any understanding of the geographical arithmetic and cartographical parameters of war. Nothing like this had ever been experienced before. But the difficulty was that when one got there, as it was, as it were, when one projected one's force, then it became astonishingly difficult to receive the outcomes one wanted. And let's be clear about this. We're not just talking about some flaw in some supposed Western system. If you look at the problems affecting the Russians in Chechnya, uh, where they were willing to use much greater, le what they call in the jargon, lethality. Lethality is I kill you. But anyway, um, where they were willing to use much greater lethality, where they, they used, for example, in the city of Grozny, the kind of um, urban destruction through the use of artillery and, uh, and uh, ground attack aircraft, which prefigures what the Assad regime has been doing in Syria. 
If they still found it astonishingly difficult to bring their version of order to, um, to the Caucasus. And of course, you can see the same thing with other totalitarian regimes. The difficulties, for example, that the Iranians faced at dealing with their Kurds. The difficulties, obviously, quintessentially, the uh, Iraqis faced in dealing with their Kurds. The difficulties the Sudanese government faced. In other words, we are apt to think that in some way, the failure of advanced or more advanced military systems is a, is a deficiency of the West and unique to the West. In fact, what is interesting over the last quarter century is repeatedly military systems have encountered uh, major problems in this respect. And that is going to continue. There is no reason to believe that in dealing with counterinsurgency, we are necessarily less good or less successful at it than other governments and other militaries simply because they have the greater capacity to inflict uh, pain uh, without much compunction. Anyway, into, rolling into the 2000s, and obviously you get the Afghanistan war and the uh, Iraq war. Interestingly enough, I say the Afghanistan war, it's, that's a classic example of the mistake that you would make as a Western analyst, or for that matter, a Soviet analyst, because of course the Afghans have been fighting each other all the way through the 1990s. In fact, one of the reasons the Afghan war took the form it did is that we arrived into a situation which was already heavily militarised, already heavily divided. We obviously selected our own allies and not surprisingly the other side, on the other, in a very shifting coalition, or war of coalitions, didn't welcome that. But in the, in the 2000s we found that after the initial confidence in technology, shock and awe and all the rest of it, we found that in practical terms, it was entirely as was to be anticipated, no easier under one technological state than it would be under another technological state to achieve the political outcome that one wanted. And again, that's going to be no diff different in the future. Whatever technological uh, margin of advantage you might have, there is still a practical problem in running a society, whether you run it with outsiders or whether you run it within your own society, because societies only work if other people internalise the rules of coercion. In other words, you know, how do tax systems work? Tax systems don't work by the state brutalising everybody that doesn't pay taxes. Tax systems work by persuading you to fill in reasonably accurately your own tax accounts. Um, military, I mean, we have a, good a, good, a very good example of this is um, uh, Argentina, for example. Argentina under the, under the junta, under the military rule in the late 70s, early 80s, was a state that was quite capable of, if they didn't like you, arresting you and you disappeared, usually thrown from an aeroplane into the river plate where you drowned and were eaten by the fish. I'm told the fish were very good in Buenos Aires. Um, but the, um, but the uh, you know, well, the flesh was softened by the, the mud at the bottom of the estuary. But the, um, but the point is, the point is that actually it was an extremely weak society. Because a society that needs a secret policeman to put you in fear of your life in order to do something is a very weak society. A society like this, which is actually a society which has loads of independent centres of initiative where the state is only a part of the way this society operates, is a much more successful society than a totalitarian one. Now, going forward, that problem is possibly going to actually get much worse on the global scale. Why is it going to get worse on the global scale? Because not of what people tend to get most worked up about in terms of the changing of the environment, which is climate change. Climate change is occurring, there's no doubt about it, and there's no doubt that it has consequences, and if you lived in the Maldives, you'd be worried about the water level rising. But that's not, the pace of that is not the real issue. The real issue is the rise of population. We are taking place in the most astonishing experiment in human history. We're putting on about a billion every 11 to 15 years. Um, now, obviously, it varies by country. As if you've been to Japan, I was there last September. You will know they have the up exact opposite problem. Their population is falling very rapidly, and their rapid population falls in a number of other countries. Hungary is a good example. Um, but on the whole, you are getting very major rises in population, and much greater volatility as a result. You have larger numbers of young men who are not absorbed into the labour market, 
and not socialised by being married and that's a remark that's true it's also intended as a compliment to the ladies present um, um, incidentally it is a, that's a reason why the differential abortion rates in East and South Asia are such a tremendous risk to the political stability of these countries because if you have a society where you might have in India or China let us say 40 to 50 million men for whom there are no women then apart from the fact that obviously you have the greatest economic opportunity in the prostitution, leaving that to one side, you also have very large rates of social instability. You have far less, far fewer socialised men. Population rises, I think, are the major challenge because what we're seeing is the development of mega cities, places like Karachi, Kinshasa, Lagos, Sao Paulo, uh, which are not really under the control of anybody. They're not really under the control of anybody. Now, you can take two different views on the military consequences of that. View one, but number one is a dystopian view, in other words, the opposite of utopian. Dyst I have to say that because I didn't realise what it meant for a long time. It's a, it's, a, it's a, well, you know, you use words and you think, maybe it's an idea to look them up. It's a dystopian, it's a dystopian uh, world view because what you end up with is a situation in which does it actually matter that in much of Karachi the state isn't in control, nobody is, is being taxed properly or paying any tax. You have ethnic gang war pol politics which causes a relatively high level of violence but the state in Pakistan somehow contains it. Okay, That's one view. The other view is, no, this is really dangerous, really chaotic, and this helps to push governments and states over the edge. It helps to make um, civil governments unstable, it leads to military coups, it helps to make military governments weak, it leads to the failure of those military systems. So if you take that view, then it is likely that what we were talking about earlier, which is the difficulty of advanced militaries being able to control society, will, whether it's the society of their own country or the society of somebody else's country, okay, that that will actually become harder with time. That's view number one. And that takes on board the fact that war should not simply be seen as, you know, the conventional old-fashioned idea that power A declares war on power B. Well, these days nobody declares war, but you get the idea, a conflict between states. And there may still be conflicts of that type. China and Japan may be starting one as we're speaking at the moment. Um, you know, just because somebody accidentally shoots down somebody else's plane and somebody else doesn't like it. You know, there may well be struggles between advanced militaries in which there is no real concern about trying to occupy large tranches of occupied territory. That kind of conflict may well continue. And obviously, Mr. Putin may well, if he is resisted, uh, as po probably he, he certainly needs to be deterred, um, may well visit something like that um, on his neighbours. So, you know, let's be clear about this. Though those kind of conflicts may well recur. But equally, it may well be the case that conflict takes the other, other perspective, which is societies where it, it is very difficult to control large-scale dissidents. Mentioning Mr. Putin provides a good example of that. If you've ever been to Tallinn, you will know that there is a picturesque and beautiful centre, which is all the tourists ever see, and you will then know if you go outside the centre, there are these very ugly Soviet-era tower blocks inhabited mostly by ethnic Russians and who are, let's put it mildly, not very happy and many of them are in links with um, the Russian Secret Service and with Russian activist politicians who are trying to, as it were, destabilise Estonia. It's very difficult to see quite how, if there was large-scale civil insurrection in Estonia, the government would find it easy to cope with. So you've got, and you know, Estonia by our standards is a relatively benign military environment um, where, you, where the pressure points on dissidents are probably easier than you're, if you're talking about the pressure points on people who are poorer, who live in, let's say, bidonvilles or, uh, or, or, or slum environments where it's much harder uh, to actually exert and, and control the environment. So going forward, what we will probably have is both narratives of war continuing. We will have the narrative of war in which advanced weaponry is what is sought, in which the assumption is and the planning is for confrontation, hopefully not conflict, um, but confrontation between similarly armed major states 
each trying to deter the other and intimidate the other, and each being willing and able to project power at great rates, and each looking for integrated um, uh, land, sea, and air systems, trying to take advantage of advances in cyber and space technology. All of that is going to be part of the agenda. No two ways about that. But yet again, if we think of that being the sole military agenda, we will underrate the military history of much of the world. And the problem with that underrating is a simple one. If you don't understand how other people see things, there's no reason to necessarily sympathise with other people. I'm not talking about cultural relativism here. But you need to understand them. Because if you under don't understand them, you will not realise what happens when you try and apply force on or to them. Because one needs to realise, and this is my last point, I think I've gone on too long, but one needs to realise that fundamentally war is not only a matter of will, it also involves very major cultural differences. In other words, different societies have very different expectations and experiences about what they mean by victory or loss, defeat or suffering or pain. The kind of society today that might be willing to take half a million casualties, half a million fatalities, is a society that is less common than might well have been the case 30, 40 years ago. Certainly less common in the West, where we have much more individualistic and atomistic societies. And these points need to be thought about. I mean, if I think of my own country, not because <coughs> it's important, but simply because I know more about it, at the time of the Falklands War in 1982, the government, were, and you know, Mrs. Thatcher was a very robust figure, the government reckoned that domestic public opinion would take a maximum of a thousand fatalities. They were only worried about British fatalities, they weren't worried about Argentinian ones. Uh, well, I mentioned that point because I once was having a long chat with an Israeli lieutenant general who was Israel's main military planner, and he was complaining to me, this was at the end of the 90s, that now he was under pressure um, not just to have... Uh, operations in which no Israelis were killed, but also to plan operations in which as few Arabs were killed as possible. So, you know, there are cultural paradigms that shift, even in robust societies, and Israel is a very robust society, uh, and under a lot of threat from its neighbours. Um, but if you think about it, 1982, there's Mrs. Thatcher reckoning that domestic public opinion will take a maximum of a thousand fatalities. Well, that very generation, uh, the, you know, all the rest of the cabinet were men, of course, um, I don't know if you know the famous joke about Mrs. Thatcher. The, you know, the cabinet, go, the, all the ministers go out for dinner and uh, the, uh, the maitre d' comes up to the Prime Minister first and says, uh, Prime Minister, what would you have for your main course? And she looks at the menu and she says, I'll have roast beef. Uh, how will you like it, Prime Minister? I'll have it raw and bloody. Uh, uh, and for the vegetables, they'll have the roast beef too. Uh, <laughs> um, um, it's a, a wonderful... Uh, why, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, let me tell you, I once talked to Mrs. Thatcher when she was Prime Minister for about half an hour, and I think talk to is the wrong word entirely. I mean, I think it's fair to say she was talking to me, and she was a very impressive person. Very, very, very impressive. Um, but the, uh, you know, those, that government, and you know, she'd been in World War II, that government had sent British troops to the Korean War. Most British people couldn't have found Korea on a map of the world. You know, in 1950, the second biggest contingent after the Americans in the International Army. By 1982, they reckoned this couldn't be done. You know, that that kind of activity could not be done. In the case of the United States, I mean, it's, you know, the United States, which took enormous casualties in World War II, by the present day, agonises much more about comparatively modest casualties. Obviously, every man and every woman that dies, it's something we really need to feel closely. But nevertheless, that's what happens when you engage in war. You know, there's no two ways about it. And you can't have one without the other. So you get cultural variation across time, but you also get cultural variation at the same time. The very same time as the Falklands War, you have the 1980-88 to 88 Iran-Iraq War, in which uh, several hundred thousand people die, in which the Iranians are using frontal attacks, famously sending little boys through mine minefields to blow up the mines. I mean, completely brutal, totally callous quite effective. It stops the Iraqis. Um, and it's a very different cultural set of assumptions. And it's precisely because of this different way in which culture operates in terms of force, in terms of reputation, in terms of society's willingness to suffer casualties, that you actually need, as Alan said, 
to think carefully before acting. One of the things we owe the military in our societies, and the military in our societies are under civil instruction, they are under civil authority, which is a great thing for our cultures. But precisely because of that, the civil authorities have a greater re responsibility. And one of the things they need to think very carefully about is not not to engage in war. War can be very necessary. There are often powers you need to act against. But you need to think carefully about the world, not as some unitary isotropic surface equal in every part. Not, you see, you get a lot of new words in the lecture here from one of me. Not in a, I always say to my students, they'll never hear the language used as well as they'll ever hear, hear it in one of my lectures. Not as some isotropic surface equal in every part, but as a surface that is variegated by culture and where the different assumptions of different peoples actually help to condition what you can achieve with force and weaponry. Thank you very much. Well, a very uh, eloquent, wide-ranging uh, meditation on war. Uh, we're open for questions, if anyone would like to begin. Let the microphone come to you. <laughs> uh, when uh, technology may not change things uh, directly, but when we shift to airplanes, it was a big difference. Now we're shifting to atomic weapons and atomic bombs. Doesn't that really set a floor for any, any situation, either context? Well, the thing about atomic weaponry um, is that actually we haven't used it since 1945. I mean, one of the interesting things about advanced technology is that it is often its use or non-use reflects the const cultural constraints. I mean, either because there is a deliberate decision not to use it or because sometimes of international agreements. I mean, one of the classic examples of that is gas. <coughs> Poison gas was used very extensively in World War I. Um, it's used to a limited extent in the interwar years. In World War II, it's only used two, twice. I mean, it's used by the Japanese for some of their operations in uh, China, and it's obviously used for the Nazis in their pathological war against the Jews. But that's it. It's, in other words, a very advanced weapon system, which in, was very effective. You know, it's quite... Uh, you could gas dropped bombs, gas, gas from shells. You know, it was quite easy to weaponize. That was taken to one side and not used. So technology can be very important. In fact, it's usually, I've written a book on war and technology, which I hope you will read, published by an American publisher, Indiana. Um, war and the most significant technologies tend not to be the technologies of killing. The most significant technologies for the military are non-military technologies. So, for example, what do I mean? Medical technologies, absolutely crucial. Until the beginning of the 20th century, armies lost more troops operating in the tropics from disease than they any, ever lost from enemy action. So it's the ability to, ha to understand. You have to first of all understand the illness and then you have to work out how to deal with the vectors. So things like malaria, that's very, very important. Number two, technologies such as the communication of uh, instructions. That's very important. The telegraph, later the radio. Number three, food preservation. In order to actually get hundreds of thousands by World War I, millions of troops operating in the full form that you do, you need to be able to preserve, transport and present both food that's nutritious and also water. So these kind of technologies are absolutely crucial. But in military terms, not necessarily so. I mean, you know, more primitive, I don't use that in any pejorative term, but more primitive peoples can often be extraordinarily successful against those that are heavily advanced. And if you take the technology we've got at the moment, a JDAM bomb, or a cruise missile is very expensive. I mean, it varies depending upon how, what kind of bulk order you buy. But if you're thinking of several hundred thousand for a, a cruise missile, you wouldn't be vaguely, you wouldn't be wrong. Drones are quite expensive, and they do tend to break after a bit. You know, to kill five people with a, you know, with a cruise missile, to kill 50 people with a cruise missile, not necessarily tremendously effective. So in many respects, and air power is a really good example of this, because I've given a lot of thought to air power, Air power has largely priced itself out of the business. I mean, if you look at the history of air power, the aircraft of the 19-teens, 1920s, pretty primitive, 
couldn't achieve very much in terms of acceleration, in terms of the ability to, uh, the height at which they could fly in terms of their payload, and this sort of thing. By the late 1930s, with all metal planes, with much more effective wings, much stronger engines, engines is the key thing, engine technology is the key thing, you're getting actually pretty good planes. And World War II, you can afford, if you're a leading industrial power, Britain, Soviet Union, the United States, quintessentially, Germany, uh, even Japan, whose, uh, whose economy wasn't so big, you can afford to manufacture thousands, even tens of thousands of planes, you can afford to train pilots, and you can afford to operate things, and you can afford specialisation. Torpedo bombers, medium bombers, dive bombers, you know, you can afford all sorts of things. After World War II, aircraft starts to get too expensive, increasingly too expensive, and they become increasingly specialised. The result being that, first of all, you have fewer of them, because you have fewer of them and you can't afford the types, you try and actually get the individual plane, like the F-35, to do everything, which of course reduces its effectiveness at doing anything. Um, you can't use pi commercial pilots to fly, and you end up with all sorts of bizarre circumstances. The United States cannot afford to lose many planes in any war. You know? I mean, it doesn't have many. It can't afford to lose many. Um, this is not actually the tremendously effective way to run an air force. And uh, to give you an idea, this is worth thinking about, and then I'll take the next question. Just think, I mentioned the Falklands. Let me give you an idea. In the Falklands, the Argentinians had some quite sophisticated planes, super entendards from the French, pretty good. Their most useful plane was actually converted crop dusters because they flew slowly enough that they could machine gun British troops on the ground. Whereas the planes flying above the speed of sound, they're just flying so fast, they couldn't engage ground targets of opportunity. So you've got to bear in mind that a technologically more <coughs> advanced system is not necessarily better, whatever you might mean by better. Sorry, next question. Sorry. So this is a good segue. So you talked about um, output versus outcome. And we talked about uh, different modes of interaction uh, with technology. Now with cyber technology, how do, you, how do you work that into the equation? Well, we don't know, because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, we, you know, if you're looking to the future, there are a whole series of technologies which are in the process of development. That's number one. In the process of conception, which is number two and in the process of possibility, but not actually, you know, so to give you an example of the third one, cloning human beings. It's entirely possible that we might be able to clone soldiers, you know, in the future, and then have a different attitude to the, towards them dying. But at the present moment, and you know, that may well be there in a hundred years' time, but it's probably, at the moment, you can't really think your way through it. It's something for people doing ethics to do. Number two, though, you can already have robotics, what you want to do with those robotics, how sophisticated they should be, is another one. And also, of course, you, could inter you can already interfere with the genetic makeup of soldiers at the moment. Now, we don't do that at the moment. We, you know, we do give them kind of stimulants and all kinds of uh, other you know, supplements, but we don't actually interfere with their genetic makeup. But you could already interfere with people to try and influence, to try and, as it were, suppress a lot of their pain or fear. Um, you know, you're getting in those kind of directions. So those kind of technologies are entirely possible, whether they would actually be cost-effective, let alone morally acceptable. And by morally acceptable, I mean people are going to actually do them. I don't know. In terms of electromagnetic pulses or things like skipping on the, on the outer atmosphere in order to be able to move troops around the world in two hours, well, again... Um, some of these are within the realms of possibility. Some of them would require the a different nature of a human being being able to respond to movement in, you know, in time and space. Uh, the same thing with, of course, uh, with um, the same thing with material material structures. Material structures, if you make them go very, very much faster, you could actually make them go faster, but they may well break up. You know, in other words, the ability to do something doesn't mean that at the end of the day it will necessarily act in the fashion that you anticipate. And that, of course, leaves completely to a side the standard thing with any new weapons technology if you develop it. The standard thing with it is not inventing a weapon that works. 
The standard thing is being able to manufacture it in a predictable fashion within, within controlled tolerance. So in other words, you want as far as possible, m as close to 100% accuracy. You don't want these weapons not working. And you want to then be able to train people to use them and operate them. So there are a whole series of contexts which we don't know quite what's going to happen. As far specifically, and I think that's a very good question as cyber warfare is concerned, as far as that goes, nobody yet is certain whether it's going to be an operational tool or a strategic tool. We don't know. If it's a strategic tool, then obviously it would be enormously important in conflict between advanced societies. If it's an operational tool, uh, then that's, you know, it could be useful, but isn't necessarily that quantum leap. And of course, one of the interesting things about military history is everybody at every age over the last half millennium has always seen the decisive weapon as just about to happen. And to a certain extent, they've been right. There are things we can do now that people couldn't do in the past. We can change human characteristics. Human beings do not naturally fly. Human beings do not naturally live below the water. There are things that we can do. But equally, so I'm, you know, I'm not being a Luddite, there are changes you can make. But equally, what they don't seem to have generally done is, may, is change the parameters of getting other people to do what you want them to do. That is much, much more difficult. I was given the, uh, <coughs> is, this, is this working? Yeah. Uh, I love that talk, Jer uh, Jeremy. Um, the concept of total war, which is what we're really con interestingly confronting uh, with groups like Boko Haram or, or uh, uh, Al-Shabaab in, in, in Kenya last two weeks ago. And, and we, we have the sense of the limitations of states, of your, your first model, the technocratic guys. They don't want to kill ordinary people. But your other group seems to ha have, there's no limits on wh what the enemy is. It can be uh, school children it can be uh, uh, anyone walking down the street. And, and, we, and we know that there's European precedents for that. I'm back to the Vendée in the 18th century or, or the French inv invading Spain in the, in the, in, in the early, tw tw 21st, uh, tw early 19th century. But surely there's an enormous change in which uh, in, in now in the last 10 years that the, the, the victimization of anyone is an enemy. And I don't know how that fits into your paradigm that you set up between the, your, your, kind of your non-technocratic group and your technocratic group. Well, that's a, good, that's a very interesting question, Richard. Um, I think the willingness to kill very large numbers of people is one in, um, as a cultural and ideological drive is strong in some contexts today. I wouldn't say it's only strong, though, in modern context. I mean, I mentioned, if, you know, if you look at the bloodiest wars since 1980, the, the bloodiest war in terms... Well, actually, question time. I wrote a book on James Bond, as you may know. We'll have a question here. You get it wrong, I press a little button, you get a mild electric shock, all right? Just a mild one, because Alan's signed up to health and safety legislation. He uh, doesn't want too much... Li uh, so... Question is, which is the war since 1980 in which the most military fatalities occurred? Iran, Iran Iraq, okay. Which is the war in which the most non-military fatalities occurred? The Congo in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now, in the case of the Congo, are different to the Islamic one in its some respect, but same sort of thing, you know, ritual castration of vast numbers of people, eating, eating their, you know, tearing them open and eating their hearts to acquire their spirits, this sort of thing. These are, they don't necessarily have to be taught reactions. You can hate your neighbour sufficiently to wish to eat him, sufficiently to wish to destroy him, uh, and you don't need to have any... You could have be a very advanced society and do that. I mean, after you think of it, the, mo you know, the Germans like to think that they were an extraordinarily advanced society and look at the 1940s. So, you know, you can, you can have this, this lust to destroy, this belief that there is an existential struggle uh, at any level of military technology. But you're absolutely right that advanced militaries in the present moment in the West do not plan for such destruction. Because they do not plan for such destruction, which is a good thing, we don't want to take, be part of such a culture, but because they don't, they're stuffed. Because you have the basic problem that if you, you want your other side to admit that they've lost, if they don't admit they're lost, 
you're going to occupy their territory, and then you're in complete chaos. I mean, I always say to my students, one of the most interesting aspects of World War II is the um, high level of resistance in, in, from the defeated. And I said, you know, the high level of resistance from the Germans or the Japanese. And they said, well, what resistance? I said, well, that's the point. That is the point. Logically, you might have assumed that the Japanese, having fought so terrifically hard in places like, you know, the Pacific or Burma, and having had a willingness to have, you know, suicide deaths, and not just kamikaze pilots, but kamikaze uh, troops on the ground, you might assume that there would have been high rates of... Of, of suicides, you know, and you'll have had some American convoy in 1948 of children on the way to school being blown up by suicide bombers and the pre President Truman saying we will never give in to terrorism, etc, etc, etc. The interesting thing is it didn't happen in 45, nor did it happen. Well, in Germany, there was a short-lived terrorist resistance movement, the werewolves. They killed few American soldiers. They murdered the mayor of Aachen, which was the first German city to surrender to the United States. But that was it, you know. And what you therefore have got to think at every stage is why is it that in some contexts you can switch off resistance or it doesn't occur or they switch it off, you know, and in other, in other contexts it's totally different. Um, and that, in my mind, tells you a lot more about whether you're going to succeed or not than actually the use of your technology. Your technology might take you into occupation of a place, but once you've got your troops marching down a street and somebody is shooting you in the back, what are you going to do? You're going to I mean, I have, I have a friend who was a major in the Israeli army, and he was telling me that, you know, he was in command of a patrol when he was a captain um, on the West Bank, and a group of kids started, you know, throwing stones at them. Now, stones, that doesn't sound serious to you. Stones can kill you, right? You know, somebody... And he said, you know, he's got this bunch of conscripts behind... He's a regular soldier. He's got this bunch of conscripts, and they all sort of are looking at him as to wonder what to do. And he says he knew he could just blow these kids apart, you know, with a submachine gun in, in a second. But it, what exactly does that achieve? You know, and that is the kind of problem that one's got unless you are willing to do what in our culture we don't do. I mean, ISIS in many senses is an astonishingly rational in terms of their pathology movement. It's a pathological movement. It's highly rational. That's one of the problems that we've got in dealing with it. Uh, back to basics. Yeah. The, um, you mentioned population explosion. Mm. Africa is the continent that is most affected by that population explosion that will continue. Um, there are 54 countries in Africa. Last time I counted, 12 were classified by the World Bank as middle income countries. What are the implications going forward, uh, particularly around war and what that means? Well, in Africa, as you know, there is both an optimistic and a pessimistic prospectus. The optimistic prospectus is that countries such as Zambia and Botswana become much greater producers of food and that, one is a, that Africa as a whole has still so a lot of rainfall, a lot of land that can be cultivated. That's the optimistic scenario. The pessimistic scenario is that you have a series of failed states, particularly in the Sahel, uh, places like the Central African Republic, Chad, and that it is very difficult to see a long-term perspective that is benign. The probability, I mean, Africa's enormous. It is an enormous continent. So the probability is that one will have success stories and failures, and that they will both coexist on the continent. But certainly in a country like Nigeria, for example, which has already been mentioned from the back, one of the things that's making the Boko Haram so difficult is major population rise in the north where there just is not the economic opportunity. And it's a society where if you're a young man and there isn't economic opportunity, you can't get land, you can't get a woman, uh, you can't get married, you, can't, you know, you're in dead trouble. You know, you don't exist. You are, you are as it were, you know, non, you know, you become demasculate, uh, emasculated in some respects. And in a sense, violence provides you with your way out. It provides you with your role. Um, and we know that it's possible to move outside that scenario. 
Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, is more benign now than it was in the early 2000s. Uh, the situation in Sierra Leone is more benign now than it was in the early 2000s. So it doesn't mean that just because one collapses, um, as those states both did, that it's a lasting collapse, but it does mean that the pressures are very great. And of course, one of the interesting aspects is all societies have to work out culturally an idea about the legitimacy of opposition. That's a really profound problem. It gets more of a problem as societies become more populous and more democratised. So, you know, however irritating it is, I mean, I get very irritated about aspects of my politics in my country. I'm sure all of you I know, Americans never get irritated about their own politics. But, um, you know, the, uh, it is a fundamental point in a democracy that when the other side wins, you don't just go to the barracks and say, right, troops. You know, when Wesley Clark lost the primaries in the, in the United States, he didn't go to the barracks and say, right, troops, we've lost. We're, you know, the tanks moved this evening. You know, it would have been laughable if he'd tried to do that. Um, he was an arrogant man, but <laughs> even he wasn't that arrogant. Um, the, uh, it's very hard, though, because many societies don't have that set of cultural assumptions. So that once you have serious economic strains, once you have shortages of food, once you have disputes over water rights, unless you've got a democratised culture which believes in the rule of law and has a policing aspect strong enough to suppress those who readily resort to criminality, then you know, you're, in, you're in difficulties. I always say to my students, I wish they had something amusing that we could, on their aunt's phones that we could all have <laughs> if they could compromise with them. Next question. Here's a follow-up yeah. from my colleague. Um, you mentioned the, the cost of, of military vehicles going forward, and clearly the future, God, I hope there's no future in warfare, is going to be predicated in the great sense on that. The major countries have to consider their military budgets, and that's going to dictate, I imagine, how they're going to, to conduct warfare. Um, jump to the next section in the future when we've got, albeit incredibly expensive aircraft, a billion dollars, a half a billion dollars apiece. More than a billion already for a state of the art. So yeah. Um, but then go unmanned. Unmanned bombers, unmanned fighters, we see them now. Most people or many people aren't aware that every time we get on a commercial airplane, they virtually can fly themselves from the mm. minute they line up on the runway until after they've landed. They land automatically. Mm. But what is this going to do to the value of humanity? And okay, well, so that's a very good question. That's several things. First of all, sometimes people do look at drones and think drones are going to be the complete change. Remember, a drone is not an unmanned aircraft. A drone has a controller. Um, and, in fact, it's quite expensive in that that's terms. Not at risk. Not at risk. Oh, no, no, they're not at risk. And also, drones are relatively slow, relatively vulnerable. They can achieve, t they can achieve against you know, places like Yemen or Afghanistan, they can chase um, ground targets. Drones against uh, other aerial vehicles at the moment it may change, may change, and not that fantastic. But you're asking the ethical question, what happens if you have a situation, a context, in which you have, as it were, um, combat decisions or made on an automatic fashion, yeah? Well, you already have that in part. Uh, planes, as you already know, a lot, you know, in, in a sense you can engage with targets automatically without the pilot necessarily switching them on at all. Um, so you've already got the technology for that. Um, is that going to change war? I don't think so. I mean, I think at the present moment it's very unlikely that we're going to get robotic brains taking over from human beings. If that was to happen, yeah, that would be different. That would be a big species change. But at the present moment there's not much sign of it. As a matter of the cost, worth bearing in mind, the cost is enormous of an advanced military system and in many senses, I mean, I've been doing a book on air power recently, it's very interesting. If you ask air senior air officers off the record, off the record, many of them are wary about the long-term possibilities for air power, precisely because of cost. It's worth bearing in mind, though, that in terms of unfunded social welfare liabilities and infrastructure liabilities and pension liabilities, you know, those are all greater for the United States than its military budget. So, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, oh, it's up to you, You're, this is a democracy, you can take part in an informed debate. Actually, you could afford to spend a lot more on defence, but you would have to have a very different social politics within your own country. It's up to you to decide whether you want that or not. But the, um, the, uh, in part, the question, though, is, with America, is what do you see as your likely 
military uh, needs. I mean, to give you an example, this may, the usual way if you're looking at it from the American perspective is to say the, that the Americans have the problems, rather like the British in the 1930s who had three major challenges, Germany, uh, Italy and uh, Japan, and then had a perfect storm because all of them ended up fighting Britain at once by the end of 1941. So the usual argument is that the United States similarly has three major areas of strategic concern. East Asia with the Pacific Rim, you know, uh, number two, uh, Russian expansionism. Number three, um, the Arab part of the Islamic world. Okay? Absolutely true. But of course, that doesn't exhaust it. Um, you could do a quite easy talk about the basis of the strategic needs for America to consider in the greater Caribbean. See, I'm going native. I should have said Caribbean. But, you know, I wanted to be polite. Uh, Caribbean. Um, so, in other words, what happens if Venezuela becomes more unstable or attacks Colombia? What happens in a post-Castro Cuba? All of these are issues. I, I was at a conference not so long ago at Carlisle. Uh, Carlisle in America, in Pennsylvania, not in, not in Britain. And in the Carlisle conference, the army was discussing, and this is it, this is what they were discussing on military challenges, closed session stuff, what to do if the Mexican frontier became undefendable by the current means? Now, the army reckoned that the Texan National Guard was strong enough to hold the Texan frontier against large-scale gang incursions from Mexico. They did not have that degree of confidence in Arizona. Okay? So they were reckoning that they would have to send units there. And then you have the thing. If you've got units there, are you going to move into northern Mexico? Because, you know, obviously, if you're protecting a line, you don't generally just sit these days behind the line. The other person can shoot at you from a great distance. How far of a forward defence do you have? What do you do? Do you actually aim to, um, uh, you know, to deal with these gangs? And remember, you know, to, this may seem ridiculous to you. Remember, nowadays, advanced criminal networks may be able to deploy more troops, more force, than the armies of small states in the world. Um, linked to that, incidentally, is an issue in terms of civil war. Um, in a state that has high levels of, let's put it mildly, problems, Colombia, Venezuela, you get several thousand murders a year. Um, if you were to get several thousand murders a year in Denmark, they would see it as a sign of the complete breakdown of society. If you were to get several thousand murders in Denmark and it was to be, or, and it was to be linked to a political movement, they would see that as a civil war. So one of the interesting issues is what in fact is war, which is a, a question, uh, and, what, and how do you identify your target? Easy to do if you've got two major states fighting each other, very difficult to do if what you're talking about is large-scale instability within countries using violence and where violence is used against it. If that is the definition of war, then war is much more extensive in the world today and much harder to suppress than if war is narrowly defined. And the problem is, you will all know senior, well, many of you may know senior military figures, the standard line with generals is they always moan about politicians. Their standard line is, give us the war, give us the job, and we'll discharge it. Well, actually, that's not what they mean. What they mean is they want to fight a conventional war of the type they understand and that they're confident with and capable with. Well, let's say Castro goes, Raul Castro goes, Fidel's already in dead, you know, he's had strokes. Let's say Raul Castro goes, he's an old man. What level of instability after that is going to excite American interests? How many refugees arriving on the coasts of the Gulf are going to lead the Americans to decide we need to do something about this? This kind of question is, you know, and, it's, it, and once you start intervening, people start shooting at other people, you start having levels of violence. So you can't necessarily assume that you will get the conflict you want. And that is the problem with the technological account. The technological account is one based on the idea that you can dictate the war that you want, you can dictate that it will take place in terms of who has the best uh, military system in terms of technology and that that side will then the side that doesn't will then accept the verdict just doesn't work like that ask the Israelis good, good military when they attacked Hezbollah Hezbollah's military isn't as good as Israel that didn't mean the Hezbollah was going to stop fighting the exact opposite 
Um, and in fact, as you know, the 2006 invasion of southern Lebanon turned out politically to be a bit of a disaster. They killed more Hezbollah, they inflicted quite a lot of damage on it, but it did not have the result that they wanted. And so one's got to be aware that is likely to go on being common. Maybe more common, maybe if you have astute leadership, if you pick or are lucky enough to be able to pick challenges that you can confront, maybe not more uh, serious. But that's one of the reasons why, when you're picking your president, you need to think about competence and thinking through these kind of issues and not the wish fulfillment fantasy of imagining that the world is as you wish to imagine it. We have time for one more question. Professor, you mentioned earlier that uh, cultural differences can dictate uh, how wars are carried out. And uh, I'd like to apply that a little bit in the context of the acquisition of nuclear weapons in the Middle East, for example. Uh, in the past, uh, culturally, the U.S. and Russia, which have been the most major nuclear powers, have been deterred from any major use of nuclear power by the concept of mutual destruction. Um, but you mentioned as well that in Iran, uh, that it has had a history of being willing to engage in total war, uh, ruthless versions of war, use of kids and minefields, etc. Uh, given that backdrop, what would be your sense of the implications of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons? Well, I think, <laughs> that's a good question, I think any uh, diffusion of nuclear weapons is extremely dangerous. And I think it would be best if Iran did not acquire nuclear weapons, period. Uh, there already is, of course, an Islamic bomb. It's actually at the disposal of Pakistan. And Pakistan itself is a state which is probably even more unstable than Iran. Um, and I, I'm, I think, in a way, you know, the, the, the horse has already bolted. Uh, the idea of the United States engaging in war against Iran to stop it acquiring the nuclear bomb, I don't think would be very practical. I don't think it would achieve the result that they wanted. You know, you'd have a fair amount of destruction, but I don't think it would achieve the result you wanted. And I think that in many senses, irritating as it is to engage with people who are probably liars, who are probably deceitful, uh, one has to see how far one could push that. I'm not convinced the cur current president has done a particularly good job of it, but it has to be said that, you know, his principal critic, Mr. Netanyahu, hasn't done a good job of it either. You know, so, you know, it's, that's probably not a very attractive thing to say here, but it needs to be said that the American policy has been weak, Iranian policy is dangerous, um, the Russians have followed a very tricky thing in giving the Iranians the nuclear reactor at Bashir, and the Israelis have been pretty stupid at getting much of the rest of the world irritated with them. Um, so I think that on the whole, it's a bit of a mess, and I can't see how one's going to get out of it. But there already is an Islamic bomb, and it's already held by a highly dangerous state. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Jeremy for some very provocative, thoughtful remarks on a wide range of topics. And I want to thank all of you for coming. We're not pushing you out the door. There's still food and drink left over. Time to uh, uh, talk to Jeremy on a one-to-one -one level. So thank you again for joining us, and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much. And be sure to join FPRI. <laughs>